Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, my name is Dan Mason. I am the Assistant Director of Historic New Harmony in beautiful uh, New Harmony, Indiana. Um, this is our next uh, installment of Virtual Community Conversations, and I, I, today we're going to be covering the New Harmony Athenaeum as a welcome center, center museum, and architectural icon. But first, uh, let me ask you to stay connected with us. Um, in August, we're going to be introducing a new architectural walking tour. Uh, you'll be able to purchase those um, uh, booklets um, at the Athenaeum gift shop. And um, it's been completely rewritten, new ph photography, and I think you're going to really enjoy our collection of architecture here in New Harmony. Second, uh, our next uh, virtual community conversation is going to be with Poet Laureate uh, of Indiana, Matthew Graham. That's August 13th at 1 p.m. Central. Make sure to register with that. It's going to be a fantastic conversation as well. And lastly, again, stay connected with this. Uh, visit usi.edu HNH virtual to see this communication, excuse me, this conversation and all the previous uh, uh, conversations there as well. Um, follow us on social media. We work hard to make sure that uh, we, we keep that rich and engaging and make sure to sign up for our monthly e-newsletter. That's where you're going to um, absolutely stay connected to the great projects, preservation work, arts and culture uh, that's going on with Historic New Harmony. So let me uh, first introduce our guest speakers for today. Our distinguished guest speakers include Jack Faber. He's a principal architect and designer with Hafer in Evansville, Indiana. Uh, just to brag a little bit about Jack, he's actually the architect responsible for the Griffin Center on the campus of the University of Southern Indiana. Absolutely one of the most incredible designs um, in uh, southwestern Indiana, so we're very proud to have him and, him and appreciate his support. As well as Ben Nicholson, who is a, a New Harmony resident and professor uh, with the Department of Architecture and Interior uh, Architecture at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So um, very glad to have both of them. Before I turn it over to them, let me just sort of set the stage that today's conversation is a bit different. Uh, we are going to talk about um, the Athenaeum as, uh, as it pertains to an architect like Jack, who is uh, actually working now in the field and what the, the Athenaeum meant to him. So he's going to go into the, the history of the Athenaeum there and then what it means to him, uh, to him uh, and to his career. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the landscape of New Harmony, the Owen period and the, the Rapites, and kind of set the stage uh, for uh, Ben Nicholson's conversation, which will be a bit more cerebral. We're going to get into the, the philosophical approach um, for this design and such. So today's conversation isn't just about a building. It's about the personification of philosophy, personal inspiration, and lasting and ever-evolving concepts in iron, glass, concrete, and especially white porcelain enamel panels, uh, which are obviously a huge part of Richard Meyer's designs. We'll discuss the history of the Athenaeum and the foundation of how it came into being and, the, like I said, transition into the more cerebral aspects and drivers. But at the end of the conversation today, I want you to walk away with a solid understanding of the history of this icon, the creative, uh, the, the critical role that it plays in New Harmony, and its ever-changing global meaning and message as a work of art. And that's gonna be a, an important thread through this conversation. You're going to see this incredible drawing um, a few times in today's presentation. This is one of my favorite artifacts in the Historic New Harmony collection. This is Richard Meyer's, uh, one of his original concepts of the whole campus of the Athenaeum. Uh, you will see the reflection pools um, the Greek theater or amphitheater. Um, I believe this was actually a grove of trees included in the fencing. And then this, uh, believe it or not, is a restaurant for the tourists. Um, but uh, it, uh, it, it's, it always just makes my day to see this incredible drawing and ha the, the massive campus that he was thinking of. Uh, we still ended up with an incredible icon, but uh, obviously as time goes on, maybe these pieces can come to fruition. The Athenaeum uh, was built between 1975 and 1979. These are a couple of pictures from the Historic New Harmonies collection as well. I, I love seeing the, the steel going up, uh, the, uh, the concrete blocks going up. You can see the, the, the outlines of the, these amazing forms uh, being built. You know, the construction crew must have just really had to struggle to understand what this was ultimately going to be because it was so revolutionary. 
um, built between 1975 and 1979. And we're still, let me make sure to say, we're still indebted to the, the uh, Lilly Endowment and the Cranet Charitable Trust for helping make this a reality 40 years ago um, it, here in New Harmony. 2019-2020 uh, and the ongoing preservation. Uh, 2019 was the 40th anniversary uh, of the Athenaeum. Uh, we held a, a wonderful celebration speaker series. Um, uh, architects and, and, and uh, educators from around the country, around the world came uh, in a gala that helped us raise over $300,000 to make these much needed changes happen. So just to, for example, refinishing floors, making signage throughout the, the experience consistent. Um, the theater audiovisual, uh, very special thank you to the Ephraimson Family Fund for supporting that. Uh, we now have absolute state-of-the-art equipment in our theater and it's a beautiful experience for theaters, excuse me, for the, for the visitors, as well as at a great space for educators and uh, for special events. Um, soundproofing, heating and cooling, the mechanical doors, this is actually um, a, a, a huge fix. Um, so when you set in the, the, the amazing theater at the Athenaeum, uh, Meyer had uh, created this experience that when the presentation started on the screen, the lights would dim and then these massive doors would open and close to close out the views uh, into New Harmony or reveal them. Uh, they haven't worked for a few years and now they do. So um, I'll ask the next time that uh, you come to New Harmony, please make sure you experience the theater and the film. Um, and if our, my team here at Historic New Harmony can help in any way, let us know. Um, the roof and the tile repairs, obviously the roof is actually probably top of the, at, of the list and we'll talk more about that. And then finally, of course, we have our wish list. But um, preservation only happens with conversations like this, uh, communicating the importance of this amazing building. And uh, again, we thank you for your time. And with that, um, let me just throw out some essential reading. Uh, ben Nicholson, uh, one of our presenters today, is one of the authors of a, a book published just last year called Avant-Garde in the Cornfields. Uh, this was a, <clears throat> a centerpiece, if you will, uh, in many ways uh, for our 40th anniversary celebration. Um, it is available in our gift shop and on Amazon, and it covers the history of the architecture in this amazing space. Well, absolutely uh, well worth your time and incredible read. And the photography is amazing and includes things that even I haven't seen. So um, be sure to check that out. With that, um, I will say one more time, thank you so much for your time and joining us, uh, these virtual uh, community conversations. Uh, we love every second of it and I hope we hope you do too. So with that, I will turn it over to, uh, to Jack. I'm Jack Faber. Uh, like Dan said, I'm an architect with Hayford here in Evansville, Indiana, and, which is next to New Harmony. And I'm very excited to talk with you today about the Athenaeum because I have been a fan of this building since 1989. And um, what I'm gonna be talking about today is really the, the place the Athenaeum has in um, modern architectural history, what kind of influenced Meyer during his education that led up to his practice and then what he did during his practice that led up to the Athenaeum and then also then what happened afterwards. So hopefully I'm, I'm gonna give you a nice broad general description of that. Um, I mentioned that I've been a fan of this building since 1989 and I know specifically uh, that date because uh, it, it's a highlight in the very first book on architecture that I ever bought with my own money. Uh, and this was due to the recommendation of my first architectural design professor. And the book I was told to buy was uh, Richard Meyer's architect book. You know, I've, I've got it right here and I still refer to it. And uh, uh, the professor was right about getting this book because the projects contained within it uh, greatly opened my eyes to what the possibilities of architecture uh, could be, and, and it really influenced my career as an architect. Um, so, now, the Athenaeum, as Dan said, was, we all know it's designed by Richard Meyer, and um, whose office is in New York City, and as Dan said, the design started in 74, with construction being completed in 1979. Uh, it's been recognized nationally and internationally as a significant work of modern architecture. Um, most notably in 1979, it was highlighted in the publication Progressive Architecture, 
And then in 1985, it won a National AIA Honor Award, uh, which is the equivalent of an Oscar for architects. And in 2018, uh, it received the National AIA 25 Year Award, which recognizes a building for its design significance to a community and for its function not uh, changing since it was originally constructed. Um, but even with it receiving these prestigious awards, um, we want to talk about why is this building architecturally significant. And uh, it's my hope that by walking you through the architectural context of the time it was designed and built, that you'll get um, an understanding of it. So uh, let's look at the, the state of the 60s and 70s architecturally. So this was a time of, of building materials uh, that were strongly in your face. You, you knew what the building was uh, made of and you could clearly see it, you could clearly touch it. Uh, it was rough and it was raw, it was brick, it was concrete, steel and glass. And those were the signature materials of the time. But um, also architecturally, you know, windows were very small and very limited and the buildings were very internally focused rather than looking out towards their surroundings. And the materiality of the design at that in the 60s and 70s was consistent between the inside and outside of the building, which could be, it, it's both good and bad. You see from these interior photos that there aren't any views to the outside and daylight comes from above at locations that make it difficult to see anything other than the sky. Uh, so why is the architecture of the 60s and 70s important in the story of the Athenaeum? And the reason it's important is because Richard Meyer and a group of friends or associates named the New York Five who were like-minded architects wanted to revolt against this style of architecture that you've just seen. And they wanted to get back to an earlier style, style of architecture that was more open, more engaging, more exciting, uh, and um, so he, he's, he's, he's looking to do something different. And so now we gotta need to look at the, the primary influence of Richard Meyer's work. Uh, and when Richard Meyer just received his architectural education at Cornell University in New York and he graduated in 1957. And while in design school, he learned about a modern French architect named Charles Edouard Jean-Henri Puy, who's who chose the name for himself, Lake Corbusier, which roughly translates to the Crowlight one, which I always thought was pretty cool. And um, it's, it's a great name for publicity purposes. And, and Lake Corbusier first became recognized internationally because of the drastically different houses he designed for wealthy French patrons. And it was Lake Corbusier's house projects that really attracted Richard Meyer to Lake Corbusier's work. So we need to look at a little bit deeper here. So just like Le Corbusier, or just like Meyer, Le Corbusier was also revolting against the style that he, that was there um, around him. And, and here you see a Beaux-Arts architectural style that uh, Le Corbusier was revolting against. And it, it used load-bearing exterior walls and had decorative columns that served no purpose. It also referenced styles of architecture that didn't match with the technical technological uh, capabilities of the day. So now, so when you look at that, we, we now need to look at one of Le Corbusier's homes that truly captured everything uh, that Meyer liked and, and captured Meyer's attention and impacted all of his future designs. And that, that house, that the inspiration is the Villa Savoy, which is located about 45 minutes away from Paris. And I typically, when I'm, when I'm talking with people about this, I always ask, you know, can you, can you guess when this house was built? And the house was built in 1929. So we're nine years from this house being 100 years old, but it doesn't look like it. And the first thing that you notice when you see it is that it's, it's white. Like Corbusier was a painter and he used white as a canvas on the exterior of the building and used color very strategically on the interior. And he also used white to make the building feel more like a piece of sculpture um, and less like a building. But there are some things that you need to understand about 
Le Corbusier style that directly apply to the Athenaeum. And the first part of, of this is another side that made Le Corbusier famous is that he created a manifesto stating five points that he believed architecture should follow. And they are uh, pilotis, which are columns. And this was the age of the automobile. So uh, the columns allowed the building and primary living spaces to be lifted off the ground. And this then became the location of the garage and the entry. Next, the free plan. This is because of columns, the walls are not load bearing. So walls can be placed anywhere on the interior of the building. And plus the walls don't hold up the roof. So the walls can even be eliminated if needed. Uh, the next item of the five points of architecture is the free facade. Uh, because the walls are not load bearing due to the columns, the facade or exterior walls aren't needed either. So openings in the exterior walls can be left open or infilled with windows. The next item is horizontal windows. Uh, due to the free facade, the windows can be any length or size. Plus they can run horizontally from the entire length of the facade, which allows the interior spaces to be sunlit evenly. Uh, in the previous image that you saw, you know, you had punched openings. And so you'd have a bright spot and then a dark spot, and then it would be bright on the interior. And so this allowed everything to be evenly lit. The last point of the five points of architecture is the rooftop garden. And since the green space on the ground has been taken away due to the building, the, it should be relocated to the roof or upper levels of the building to provide space for the inhabitants and for the protection of the roof. So these were very forward thinking concepts that we take for granted today, uh, but in the 1920s, they were considered extremely avant-garde. Now, once we go inside, we need to notice some things. Le Corbusier used ramps and different circulation methods for traveling vertically through the home. And he also uses extremely large windows and openings to, to provide views out to nature and while also allowing nature to feel like it flows back into the space. Also notice the use of pipe rail on the stairs. We'll see this, you'll, you'll definitely see this trend or this theme in, in Meyer's work, especially in the Athenaeum. Now, during my research for this presentation, I, I discovered this photo and, and thought it was a perfect for this explanation. See, here we see a model of the Villa Savoy and a young Richard Meyer posing next to it. And what's interesting is Richard Meyer is known not only for his architecture, but also for the physical model he creates for his architectural designs. And in fact, his firm has built so many models over 50 years, uh, or 50 plus years, that they've created an actual model museum in North New York that you can visit. And if you actually do go there, uh, they do have the original Athenaeum model on display. And so at this point, you, we all should have a general understanding of the major influences that Le Corbusier had on Richard Meyer's architectural education. But now we need to look at the design work Meyer created once he started his own architectural practice in 1963. And this will allow us to see how important the, the influence of Corb was on Meyer's work. So Meyer's first project besides the one that he did for his mom was uh, that gained national attention is the Smith House and it's in Darien, Connecticut and it was constructed in 1967. And similar to Le Corbusier's work, we can see the use of columns, we can see a free facade, we can see windows that can be randomly organized and extremely large and vertical circulation through the structure is, is highlighted. And Another similarity is the color white. Le Corbusier used white to help accentuate the sculptural qualities of his projects. Now, Richard Meyer chose white for a different reason. Uh, to Meyer, white is never just white. In an interview, he, he stated this about his color selection. He said, architecture is expressing a quality of light. It should also allow you to appreciate nature that's around you. White is all colors, it's everywhere, everywhere you look. Whiteness, in a sense, reflects nature and it refracts light. It makes you more aware of the colors of nature because of the whiteness of the buildings. And so because of this design philosophy regarding this color, all of my, well, I'd say almost all, there's a few that aren't quite exactly white, but all of them are, are essentially white and uh, carry this, this tradition. 
So here's some other examples of the home's interior, and we can clearly see the influence Lake Corbusier had on, on uh, Meyer's work. And this photo shows you the transparency of the home and how it glows in the evening. Now, Meyer's next major project that gained national and international attention is the Douglas House in Harbor Springs, Michigan, which was constructed in 1973. Now, in this project, Meyer is becoming more adventurous in his interaction between solid and transparent walls. He's still referencing Le Corbusier, but he's modifying the five points of architecture to suit his own preferences and design needs but the consistency of a pure white structure still remains. Uh, you also see here uh, white pipe handrails leading, to, leading guests across the bridge to the entry to the home. And the front facade is very flat and solid with few windows. And it is when you get inside that the home really opens up. And so this is the home's main double height living space with spectacular views of, of the lake. And here's another view looking straight out towards the lake. And just like in the Villa Savoy and the Smith House, the Douglas House expresses and celebrates vertical circulation with cantilevered stairs and ship ladders. And this becomes a consistent, constant theme in Meyer's work and will be taken to the, to the max in the Athenaeum. And finally, we see the Douglas House from Lake Michigan and the house sits on a concrete base that elevates the home far above the streets. And it's, it's, it's truly not bad for a, a vacation home. Great location. Um, here we have the entry view of the Smith House on the left and the entry view of the Douglas House on the right. And both photos show the house's exterior construction to be white painted wood siding. And using this material uh, allows the homes to appear very sculptural and helped with the construction budget, but this material did not provide Meyer uh, with the maintenance longevity he wanted, and because the wood siding requires repainting and careful upkeep. It also doesn't give the building human scale. Uh, what I mean by that is it's difficult to determine how big the buildings are because there's nothing referencing the size of a human other than the doors. So Meyer takes this issue to heart in the Athenaeum and creates a solution that he then uses on all projects and designs afterward. So now that we've got all this background, let's take what we've learned and, and do an examination of the Athenaeum. Here we see the Athenaeum site plan with the Athena Athenaeum, excuse me, being circled in red. The building's design starts off as an overlay of two different grids. Uh, the first grid is the, the first is the town grid of New Harmony, and the second is a grid that is rotated five degrees off the town grid. And, and the, the reason for that is it's based on the traditional path that travelers would take from the river to the town. And when we take a closer look at the floor plan, we can see the reference to Lake Corbusier by the use of PLOTs, the free plan, the free facade, and the celebrated methods for vertical circulation. And we can also start to see how the walls, the spaces, and the vertical circulation is impacted and made more dynamic by the interplay and overlay of the town grid and the five, and the five degrees uh, offset grid. And when we start looking at the exterior, we can see the grid is not only limited to the floor plan, because the grid now extends to the surface of the building. And this was, this is Richard Meyer's solution to his previous issue with his buildings not having a sense of human scale. Uh, for this solution, uh, Richard Meyer chose to use for the first time on one of his projects, porcelain enameled metal panels. And the panels also addressed another concern. Uh, Meyer had, uh, it, it, it addressed his concern about longevity uh, of the building's exterior materials. He felt the use of these panels would allow the building to look good and beautiful for many, many years with limited reduction in quality or beauty. And What's noteworthy about this image is the curving glass walls. Now, this portion of the building faces the river and references the flow of the water in the undulating curves. And here, the grid can be seen in two different scales. The small scale of the panel grid, and then the large scale created by the building structure. Now, now notice the stepped ramp on the exterior. It, it creates a diagonal through the building mass. 
It's like a portion of the building was cut away from that and, and flipped over and then set out in front of it to be used as the ramp to exit the second floor space. Now, the long ramp on the east side of the building directs visitors to the adjacent historic structures and starts and allows them to start a, a, a tour of the town. Now, moving inside the interior of the Athenaeum is focused around a central ramp that leads visitors on an architectural promenade or path that tells a story while traveling on it. And the ramp leads to a, the theater space that Dan was talking about earlier and the exhibition locations. But the, the exhibits were limited when the building was initially designed because the surrounding nature and historical structures that you see through the windows the, to the town, those were to, always intended to be the true exhibits. And you would see them through large windows that captured the views and, and create a desire in you to go out and actually experience them um, in, in the real world. So finally, what was the architectural impact of the Athenaeum? Okay, so due to the success and critical acclaim of the Athenaeum, Richard Meyer was invited to compete for a project that at the time had a final total project cost of $1.3 billion in 1997. So I can only imagine what that would equate to in today's money, but, or well, it, 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 it actually equates out to $2.1 billion today. Uh, the architect selection process took place and in 1984, Richard Meyer was selected to be the architect for the Getty Center in Los Angeles. And the design and construction process took 13 years to complete. And here you can see the entire Getty Center complex from, from there. It, it's an entire hilltop. The, the entire hilltop was, was raised to prepare for this complex integrated architectural element. And this starts to give you a glimpse of the size and scale and complexity of the project. And the same architectural language used at the Athenaeum was employed here to great success. In addition, the same porcelain enamel panel system developed at the Athenaeum was also used. And it's in these views, it is definitely apparent that the Getty Center is a continuation of the design language shown in the Athenaeum in Meyer's earlier work. So finally, this is, this is a Richard Meyer quote that seems specifically appropriate to the Athenaeum. Um, when I'm asked what I believe in, I say that I believe in architecture. Architecture is the mother of all arts. I like to believe that architecture connects the present with the past and the tangible with the intangible. I believe this is the perfect summary for the relationship the Athenaeum has with New Harmony. It connects the present with the past and the tangible with the intangible, and both are stronger because the other exists. I, I hope this brief explanation shows you the Athenaeum, how the Athenaeum fits into the continuum of architectural history, and I'm, I'm very grateful I could be here with you today to share with you my, my passion for this uh, very special, very unique building. Uh, I, Thank you very much. And I'm going to um, end this and allow um, the next speaker to continue. So excuse me here, let me get this. Jack, thank you so much uh, yeah. for the presentation. That was fantastic. Um, uh, so before, before we launch into uh, Ben Nicholson's, I'd like to ask uh, Claire Eagle for my team to take just a couple of, of minutes just to kind of set the stage. So you now understand um, the, 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 the facts behind uh, the development of the Athenaeum, the sort of the, the design approach, the architectural approach and what have you, but, but why New Harmony? And what, what happened in New Harmony bef uh, before we decided to uh, build this incredible icon, uh, this welcome center and such? Uh, uh, Claire, do you want to talk about the uh, the Owen period and uh, the, the Rapites, just quickly? So I'll I'll give just a quick you know the the two minute the nickel nickel tour so to speak. So um, New Harmony um, is founded in 1814 by the Harmonist Society, 
which was a group of Lutheran separatists led by a man named Father George Rapp, um, who had come to America um, to be able to practice their religion. They first settled in um, Pennsylvania in a town called Harmony. Um, they first settled there in 1804. Um, in about 10 years, um, they uh, had built um, a quite a big town. Um, they were thriving. Uh, but one important thing had not happened, and that was that Jesus Christ had not come back yet. So these people, these harmonists, had this millennial belief uh, that Jesus Christ was coming back any day now. And they lived a certain way so that when he did return, um, they were ready to go. And, and that kind of um, had three pillars. So as I said, uh, uh, that millennial belief. They lived celibate. Uh, they uh, did not perform marriages. If you came in as a family, uh, your family still lived together, but you were no longer husband and wife, you were brother and sister. Uh, they uh, uh, lived communally, so all of their resources were shared. And then, uh, as I said, they, uh, they believed Jesus Christ was coming back. So uh, in 10 years, it still had not happened, and Father uh, Rapp decided that they must not be in the right place. And he kind of used this idea that uh, they needed to be somewhere better for grapes to grow as they did make lots of wine. That was one of their big exports. So they moved here to New Harmony. Now they uh, uh, began here in 1814. They were here for 10 years. And in those 10 years, they built 180 structures, uh, many of which are actually still in New Harmony, either in pieces or um, all together. Uh, but as I said, after 10 years, Jesus Christ had still not come back. Um, and Father Rapp was starting to get a little antsy again and knew that he needed to move his community um, someplace else. So they returned back to Pennsylvania. They made their third and final community called Economy. And then they, uh, they kind of ended up dying out as one does when, when you are celibate. So uh, Father Rapp sold a town to a man named Robert Owen, who was a Welsh industrialist. And he had a lot of great grand ideas, um, social reforms, and he had been wanting to find a place where he could put all of these ideas into practice. And when he saw this entire town up for sale, um, he thought, isn't that just perfect? So him and his partner, William McClure, um, bought the town and everything in it and began the second utopian experiment, experiment excuse me, in New Harmony. Uh, that experiment didn't last too long, uh, really a little bit less than two years. Um, but the, the chief difference was that this experiment depended more on knowledge and education instead of religion. Uh, he invited scholars um, and teachers to New Harmony to help educate and uh, kind of get his community going. As I said, it didn't last very long. There were a lot of problems. Um, including um, the biggest being that there was all of these scholars, but not people to uh, tend the fields, to raise the cattle, that kind of thing. So it really wasn't successful. So unfortunately, that official community kind of disbanded, and Robert Owen did end up going back to Europe, um, where he uh, was able to put more social reforms into place, but uh, did die in Wales. So um, after that, New Harmony became just a regular community. Uh, it's a thriving community. Um, and we kind of get to where we are today because of a woman named Mrs. Owen. Now, if you joined some of our previous conversations, I'm sure you've heard her mentioned, or if you joined the conversation we had about her, Mrs. Owen was very important to New Harmony. She married Kenneth Dale Owen, who was the great, great grandson, I believe, of, of Robert Owen. And she came here on their honeymoon and just fell in love with this town and saw a reason to help save it. So she put um, much of her own money into this town. She opened the Red Geranium and the New Harmony Inn. She commissioned the, the Ruthless Church. And finally, she saw a need for that to continue, even if it wasn't her that was leading the, leading the charge. So she brought a man named Ralph Schwartz in to lead Historic New Harmony, Inc., who eventually brought Richard Meyer to New Harmony in the 70s um, and commissioned the Athenaeum. Excellent. Thank you, Claire. So with that said, uh, let's go into uh, Ben's presentation. Again, Ben is a New Harmony resident and professor from the Art Institute of Chicago. And uh, he's going to, we're going to talk more about the philosophy and such. And uh, um, 
And like I said, so much of this is in his incredible book that was published last year, Avant Garde in the Cornfields. Ben, your uh, microphone is still muted, I believe. Is that good? Perfect. It's That's all good. Yours. It's all yours. Okay. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm standing here in the Athenaeum uh, on, on this uh, rainy and beautiful day. And um, I'm going to talk about the um, very immediate uh, experience of the Athenaeum. I've lived here for now 14 years and um, have a, a, a real love affair with this building. Um, and, and it's been uh, a real inspiration, still continues to be so. Uh, this is a uh, Ezra Stoller photograph, um, one of the great uh, modernist photographers. And um, I need to, okay, and um, I, I, I want to talk about this building um, as having many responsibilities. Um, it is an international building. Uh, it is a place uh, where cosmopolitan architecture is, 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 is val validated. Um, it, it's also a building that inspires uh, the, the area, the region, uh, uh, and, and has had um, many good um, uh, uh, followers and, and advocates of the place. And it also uh, deals with the kind of immediacy of what it is to be in the ground and uh, and so forth in the vernacular. So these three uh, drivers of the cosmopolitan, on the provincial and the vernacular, they uh, sit nicely in this building. We've already looked uh, at, at the uh, you know wonderful uh, series of photographs of Villa Savoy. Uh, uh, Le Corbusier was a painter. Uh, as they say, he did uh, painted in the morning, architecture in the afternoon, and wrote at night every uh, creative's uh, dream. Uh, and uh, uh, Richard Meyer has a similar kind of practice, not, not the writer, but certainly the collagist. Uh, and th that is one of his many collages down below. This is a building of collage, uh, of different ideas coming at different velocities, uh, at different speeds. Um, so um, there is no question that uh, uh, Maya was um, deeply um, inspired by the uh, purists. Here is, I believe, Juan Gris. And um, uh, you will see the, the uh, adjacency of, of concept in this painting with the uh, uh, early uh, plan that Dan showed us in color uh, at the beginning of the talk. Um, Okay, um, also um, Maya slipped in his own references. So uh, in the middle here, we have uh, a, a, a sort of Juan Gris, uh, excuse me, a, a Piet Mondrian uh, painting within the building. So there are all, all sorts of these links to um, that period of modernist history. Um, this is a collage that he actually, uh, Maya ed um, exhibited in New Harmony uh, when the building opened. And uh, in many respects, it is the loose conceptual uh, concept of this building, of a little ramp on the left, uh, of a block, and then things happening, and then things popping out. Uh, and, and, and so that is um, an important consideration, that this building is, is, has these drivers of the painterly world and then the uh, um, architectural history uh, uh, running at the same time. Um, he was uh, an advocate of uh, geometry, and um, we've already heard how the five degree shift happens in the plan, which we'll get to in a little bit later. Uh, but he also has uh, in this um, amphitheater, uh, the whole room is uh, bound by the golden mean. And um, he has uh, uh, spoken eloquently about that. So uh, this building has these um, dichotomies in it. Um, there is the squeaky clean golden mean, and then these, uh, what should I say, uh, slightly errant and devious uh, 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 shift, grid shifts. At Princeton at this time, uh, the student theses were, were uh, all adding shifts and grids. And um, uh, speaking to one of the people who worked with Maya, um, uh, a four, four degree 
shift was considered a big deal at that time. Um, the uh, uh, New Harmony has uh, six sets of drawings, a, a number of uh, um, uh, single sheets as well. Uh, the building had a lot of work done, had a lot of changes, and um, we'll look at that uh, a bit here. Um, one of my favorite drawings uh, that he made, uh, which has um, the Athenaeum. Is the pointer visible? Here's the pointer. There's uh, the Athenaeum that orig originally had a uh, administration room and an amphitheater. There's a five degree grid. And then we hop over to a building he made, um, the pottery studio uh, for Jane Owen, which is here. Uh, and then a log cabin and then a J Johnson's roofless church. Uh, and then uh, Frederick Kiesler, believe it or not, uh, uh, designed, and then this park was uh, inspired by his, by his project. And lingering down in the grid is this wonderful um, uh, blank space, uh, a, a graveyard without any gravestones that uh, the harmonists made. So um, when you look at this photograph, uh, what you can see is a building that has no roads to it. Uh, it is um, held by these wonderful skinny threads like a spider's web, and it just sits in the landscape um, uh, hesitant about uh, being in the world, uh, floating, you might say. Um, there is the first path that leads to the town uh, down the ramp, uh, and um, then the second path uh, that, that, uh, that we looked at earlier that leads to the river. And um, uh, at the end of this path, uh, recently, uh, a big, uh, in the last 30 years, a big stone has been put um, by, the, by the Girl Scouts. So um, what we're witnessing here is what I would call a gradual um, uh, degradation of concept that uh, on the right is a, uh, possibility of the path going to the river and then because someone has a good idea at some point they decide to do something with the Girl Scouts uh, that concept that architectural concept of a building being linked to the river is broken. So um, we've got this relationship with the river. The second um, uh, uh, path um, which we're talking about uh, deals with the origin of the building uh, linking to this concept of a boatload of knowledge where all of these high octane uh, intellectuals uh, um, came up to New Harmony. So not only is this path a path to the river, but it's also a path to learning and a path to the great uh, Athenaeum system that uh, 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 motored the intellectual curiosity of cities both in England as well as the United States in the 19th century and earlier. The third path um, on the top is um, a route that uh, leads up from the uh, parking lot to the building. It's, it was originally pretty narrow and uh, Maya had these wonderful um, kind of na nautical uh, 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 light towers. And then um, with a recent uh, refurbishment, um, that path was uh, made into a road for vehicles. Uh, and um, simultaneously, uh, we had um, these very gentle lights. Uh, and then uh, more recently, um, the uh, lights have become these acid um, uh, bright bulbs that burn your eyes out. So this is one of those ex experiences whereby the intention of the building of being a place of pedestrian access uh, only. Uh, golf carts were kept in the parking lot and Maya had um, uh, drawings for that and thank goodness they're back there. Uh, it was always a pedestrian project. Hey ben. So this is... Oh, I'm so yes. sorry to interrupt. We had a question that I thought you, you would be able to answer. Um, this is from Tom Stahl in our chat. Uh, he said yeah. he's just curious about the five degree offset of the building because of the river. He understands the idea and think it, thinks it was a good idea, but why does it not intersect the river bank at 90 degrees and has the bank shifted? Well, we have some of Illinois on our side of the river. 
Um, so the river shifts constantly. And um, I don't know where it was in 1979, but it might have been a little bit more 90 degree-ish than it is today. I would say it is less about being uh, a, a radial point to the tangent of the river's curve and more about a, uh, a, a concept of linkage uh, and also a concept of breaking grid. Uh, we heard earlier about the shifting of the grid uh, of the building to the town. So this is a sort of deliberate uh, early architectural period of the deconstruction, uh, a, a deliberate uh, breaking of the modernist grid. So it's a conceptual move rather than a practical move, but in the end, they all fit together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So here's a uh, helicopter shot uh, of that road and um, actually doesn't need to be that wide. You see here the, the, the tracks of the vehicles, um, if the lamps were uh, offset, uh, and, and this part of the road actually slams into a concrete block, which you see over the left-hand side, so it's a little bit iffy. Um, now, <laughs> you know, life is comic. Uh, dear Dan, um, uh, our leader of the uh, uh, historic New Harmony, has a wonderful car, he's actually uh, got a new one now, that he parked right in front of the um, Athenaeum. And um, on the right-hand side is the Lily Rolls-Royce, um, that was parked there in 1979 uh, when the uh, um, patron of the building, uh, the one who paid for it, came to visit. Richard Meyer, in my opinion, was adamant, as with many historic buildings, think about going to um, any of the buildings in Rome or so forth, that when you go to the building, it is a, a transformative experience. And that the reminder of uh, something as prosaic as an automobile uh, snaps you out of uh, that mindset. So here is an example of a well-intentioned uh, desire to have a widened road having very, very significant consequences for the architectural read of the project. Um, and for, and for the record, I was setting up for your presentation that day, so. <laughs> We enjoy our jokes on uh, Dan and I. We, you know, we, we have a lot of fun with this. But um, in the end, uh, you know, all, all of the things of great seriousness uh, have an absolute. element of the comic to them. Um, this building is an absolute symphony of movement. Uh, and there is really every kind of uh, um, step and uh, circulation form uh, that you can imagine. Uh, and, and, and Richard Meyer says, well, you know, the building is really a thing to walk through. It is to walk around. It is to walk over. Uh, you zigzag up it um, and uh, you actually climb on top of the building so that you don't, the building is not so much a mm, place to uh, do things rather than an instrument with which to see the town. So this would be the path that literally goes through the building. Uh, and then the wheelchair ramp uh, allows for accessibility for everybody um, that, that can get up into the building and it's a tight space. Um, this wonderful uh, bench ramp that I like so much uh, that uh, rips up the uh, side of the building and then the, the, the carpet uh, rolls over the seats in the, in, in the auditorium uh, so that in many respects, the stairs become the seats. In other words, uh, Meyer is uh, uh, playing games with us to challenge our sense of uh, up, down, left, and right, and over and under. One of my favorite spaces is this glass box within which there is a spiral staircase. And so you never really know whether you are inside the building or outside of the building when you are at this building. Um, up over the top of the uh, building uh, goes the walkway. And um, you have this uh, you know, classic Le Corbusier vision of the, of the uh, 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 architectural building as, as the ship. And um, this is when the river is high, usually four or five um, uh, times every seven years, when the building literally sits in the water. It's a beautiful sight. 
Uh, the other thing um, that, that, that we uh, have been talking about is the way that the light reflects the building. Here's the muddy water and the evening sun, and the, the, the building becomes pink, really a lovely color. And um, here is the moment where the building uh, uh, has a, it has a membrane on the roof, and at one point there was uh, stones, uh, river stones, round river stones. So when you went up on that roof, uh, there was a sort of Kyoto garden up there uh, of, of stones. Uh, but of course the kids um, uh, got the stones, threw them uh, over the wall, and broke the windows. Um, but that doesn't mean to say you can't do something of a similar nature. Here's Ram Koolhaas's uh, Cornell uh, building, which is made of sedum. Uh, very, very nice uh, solution. Um, one of my favorite steps, um, you don't know whether you're coming or going, uh, there's a sort of, certain kind of violence to it. Um, and then here is uh, the building uh, being used as a object to walk over. And on the right is uh, this podium that looks over the um, graveyard. And uh, sadly, the, build, the, the, the building um, was um, um, closed off on its roof um, for uh, safety reasons. And um, with any luck, we'll be able to get that back so that the building can be used as it, as it is. So here's an example of a building being made, its intention as an optical instrument to see the town. And then due to uh, the reality of uh, insurance, uh, the, the, the concept of the building is just shut down completely. So in the period of reimagining the building, uh, the, the, the uh, linkage between insurance and architecture and architects and thinkers uh, has a chance to reconvene so that you, the intention of the building is regained. Ben, I have a few more questions, if you don't mind. Do you want to ask them at the end? Um, we've got, uh, I really would like to, to um, finish up. Uh, yeah, if, if that's the okay. case. Yeah, of course. Um, the, um, um, right, where are we? Are? Sure, sure, sure. Um, okay, so this is this concept of, of uh, the degradation of an idea, um, and um, there we go, okay. Um, okay, so now we have um, um, other intentions. The, the, the building um, is not fully accessible, and so what to do about that? Now, it turns out, uh, on one hand, you could push someone up the ramp, that's great, that's how it was designed. But Maya actually had a series of uh, proposals for an elevation, an elevator in the building. So um, uh, these questions have been asked already by the architect so that when we come back to reimagine the building by looking at the drawings, we can see what the proposals were. Um, my favorite, um, uh, part of this is the great work done on, on the bathrooms. I mean, he had six different proposals. Uh, and, and now that, that bathrooms are, uh, by law, needing to be reimagined, it would be a terrific opportunity for someone like uh, Joel Sanders, who's done a lot of work on desegregated bathrooms. The New York Times had a pretty interesting essay about this. In other words, the, the room is taken, the uh, architect uh, works with a thinker such as uh, uh, Joel, and um, the, the, the uh, desegregated bathroom could become part of the building. Yeah, I mean, bathrooms are fantastic. Frank Lloyd Wright, Mies van der Rohe, they're all wonderful. And um, we have a very good bathroom here. Um, this is the boys' bathroom, uh, and, and it has this raking neon light um, that gives a very particular kind of shadow. Everything counts. Um, yeah, um, the, the, the building, uh, original, the way that Maya and uh, Ralph Schwartz had the building at the beginning was to have um, artifacts that would describe the intentions of the community. Robert Owen uh, and McClure, they bought the town, uh, lock, stock and barrel, with the intention of building a city for 2,000 people, uh, the phalanstery as it's known, uh, on a hill three miles away from New Harmony. So for Robert Owen, uh, and, and McClure, um, the, uh, New Harmony's um, uh, uh, life um, was actually going to radically change with what you might call the Georgian Square in the middle of nowhere. There it is, 19, 1824, 
uh, a, a building much like the Georgian squares of London, but this is for the work, working person. Libraries, uh, these towers had light, uh, that, that, um, like a lighthouse that would project into everybody's bedroom. This is the real Robert Owen that is in New Harmony and uh, the architects uh, Steadwell uh, worked with him. This model was in uh, Congress for a number of years and sadly it's uh, no longer with us. So, incremental degradation. 1979 starts with, on the right hand side, um, I, I guess this cantilever started swinging. What, what are we to say? And so some um, uh, rectangular tubing was uh, welded onto the, uh, the cantilever and that changes the meaning of the building. Um, the, I just tried to um, fill up my uh, 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 water glass with um, water uh, from Richard Meyer's wonderful little fountains um, and um, they don't work. Uh, I think the Coca-Cola machine has been taken out, which I'm really happy about. Um, uh, sorry, Coca-Cola, but um, uh, <laughs> there's other agendas out there. Um, and then um, we've got um, a, a, uh, the, the terrific theater, and Dan is doing a spectacular job on getting all the windows to work and the ideas of uh, moving at the end of the film out through the wall into nature. Terrific things. And then there is this, what I call the Harry Potter uh, viewing place uh, in the building. Now, um, these are, are these are very slight moves, but they are important ones for the meaning of something. Recently, a kind of rubbery brick was put into the um, uh, quadrangle, I'm sorry, the, 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 the glass box. Now, on the right, you see Maya's original tiles that is a 45 degree angles grid. And this is very important conceptually for a read of the building because the bricks are not parallel within any particular window. They are there that uh, 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 makes for another grid and another sensibility. Um, the incremental degradation of the word, oh boy, it could be um, put into any edition of uh, any book that has uh, existed for a couple of thousand years. Um, the, uh, the, the graphic designer of the, te of the uh, font, uh, forgive me, I forget what his name is, terribly important person, uh, has got some, uh, uh, made, made the font for the, uh, for the building and majority of it is still there. Uh, but this is one of those great moments of men and then beneath it, men. Now, which men are we talking about? So how, how as designers do we acknowledge that typefaces and fonts and ways of, of projecting an idea in, at one period is any more important than another? My favorite is uh, this uh, Sartre no exit uh, sign to a door, um, that the great, great play. Um, so um, we have to look after all of these matters. So um, in restoration, and our town is in a constant state of restoration, any building, something's being dickered with constantly. How do we keep the intention of the building uh, as a way to, to think about the, the town and its past and its previous history and its present history? Um, I, I, I would say that um, these are very, very important questions. Uh, and uh, having initiating a conference would be terrific to do. Uh, the Venice Charter of Historic Preservation is absolutely spectacular document uh, and, and uh, written a long time ago and its points are as good now as they ever were. Um, and uh, then there is the question of the original firm. Uh, in, making a, in making a project, particularly one uh, with Richard Meyer, um, the reality of his practice and his life in 1979, very different from 2020. And so we have the possibility to have an architect think about the same thing in two different ways. And this is a remarkable uh, opportunity and, and one that uh, is not often taken to have the original architect uh, do the upgrading of the building, but it would be terrific to do. Uh, and. Um, yeah, so uh, the Athenaeum, it's a work of art. Um, think of it as uh, any of the great uh, buildings and works of art. Now this is uh, complex. Um, 
you will see here uh, that uh, Richard Meyer has uh, been in the news uh, over the last couple of years and um, it has changed the meaning of the building, maybe not for by generation of architects who think of it as an aesthetic, um, a place of aesthetic uh, rumination, but for, um, uh, for the way things are in the world, particularly for the younger generation, uh, there is a new kind of reckoning uh, with the meaning of a building. And what I love about New Harmony is uh, Jane Owen on the left-hand side, uh, she worked with the great uh, theologian, Protestant theologian, Paul Tillich. And for her, New Harmony is a place where uh, you were estranged and then you were re reunited. And so Jane Owen has this, had this beautiful vision uh, of having New Harmony as a place apart from uh, the everyday and uh, that it would be a place to where you could come to think about very deep and difficult and complex subjects. Um, so uh, I, I would say that our building here, uh, it, it, you know, whether we like it or not, it can work with that kind of responsibility. And this is a, uh, a uh, local um, uh, resident, uh, Tom Williams. Uh, he made this collage of the uh, Athenaeum and um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very open place. I often think, oh my goodness, uh, maybe Banksy will, Banksy will uh, come, come one day in the middle of the night and spray that white wall with some mice or something like that and change the meaning of the building. So thank you very much. Ben, thank you very much. Um, and and I'll, I'll say to everyone, um, because of these conversations and because of um, you know, the wonderful minds of uh, Jack Faber and, and Ben Nicholson, uh, it's, it's really um, refined our approach uh, for projects and, and preservation of the Athenaeum especially. And the 40th really shined a light on the building and through just incredible, incredible support uh, from uh, donors at all levels, um, we have tackled um, the, many of the projects, uh, the fonts are now consistent and uh, we are working to, to, you know, like I said before, thanks to the Ephraimson Family Fund, we have, um, you know, a proper theater and we, we still have an entire laundry list of things to tackle and a wish list. Uh, and Ben and I have talked about this before. First and foremost, it's a visitor center and that evolution will happen. And so, you know, it's, uh, a sidewalk may have to be widened because of codes or for safety purposes or, or whatever it might be, but it, it's a balance. And the best way to strike that balance is with, um, by pulling uh, people together and having these conversations. And uh, that's been, you know, Historic New Harmony's um, uh, promise. It's part of our mission as we're moving forward. And, and I think we're getting, getting even tighter with it. Um, so I, I thank you guys for that. Um, I'll say we, we have, we're, we're a little bit over on time. If everyone's okay, we are going to get to all, we've got some great questions. But Claire, if you don't mind me asking the first one. Uh, ben, can you talk about the niche that's cut out in the stage of the theater that perplex, perplexes everyone as they walk in? Hmm. Sure. <laughs> um, there, there is a, uh, a Nick. A, a, a little cut. Uh, can you? I'll just go for a walk. I'm like three feet away. Can you see? Can you see? Can you see me? No. Yes. Yeah. There. That's. Is this what you're talking about? This yes, nick. That's it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, we, th this nick is a, a constant irritation to everybody who comes here. Architects and. Uh, 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 um, uh, man in the street, woman in the street, alike. Okay. So. How do we read something that there is no manual for? Uh, this is the critics project. Um, on one hand, that Nick um, in the drawing is an extension of a line that uh, comes from the, um, the uh, steps. Now that would be one reading. Another reading is uh, we've talked about uh, the grid through the building. Uh, and um, there is a grid of columns through the building and, and, and there are accommodations made for the structure. Uh, for example, uh, you see there the rail, the rails actually go around the columns. 
Um, and so Maya is referring us to uh, Villa Savoy and the opportunity for a kink in the system. Um, for me, uh, I like it there because when you walk into that building, into that room, it is a place of discussion. It's of listening to things that you uh, may be uncomfortable for you. Uh, that's the academic's um, responsibility is to raise truths that may be uncomfortable. Uh, and that little kink, my read is that it makes you uncomfortable. It it's, doesn't fit, you don't know why it's there, uh, and yet it's there, it's like a thorn, in, a moat in the eye, let me put it that way. Excellent, Claire? All right, so we've gotten um, a few questions. Uh, the first uh, refers to the flooding. Um, Jeremy Ephraimson has asked, does the river flooding um, equal a reflecting pond? Do you think that uh, Richard Meyer planned for that in the flooding? Is that for Jack? Uh, either one, either one. I'll, I'll say that um, when you see the, when you see the drawing that had the reflecting pond um, later design show, and, and even in that view that you see on, on Ben's screen there, the, the building is, is elevated up on a, on a man-made hill um, to keep it out of the, the flood plain. And I'm sure thinking, thinking about the times when the, the land or the, that surrounding would flood that when the, those ponds weren't a part of the design because of the cost, those are opportunities then that nature provides them and gives you those views and, and those reflections that were, were originally intended. So um, I'm sure it's, you know, he was, based on constraints, allowing nature to do what it does best and, uh, and then capturing the building to accentuate it and use it. Yeah, but the only thing I would add is that um, uh, the design process has all of these um, often quite humorous um, references that exist within the set of drawings. So um, as Jack says, um, there were reflecting pools. And then because of cost, they don't happen or because of program change. And, and therefore the, the designer and the people who know the building, they see those reflecting pools, even though they're not there. In, in other words, architecture has all these layers in it, multiple layers. Uh, great, this is a question for you, Ben. Um, Amanda has asked, uh, that you briefly mentioned the pottery studio. Um, is that um, a Richard Meyer design as well? Okay, so when the building was made here, Jane Owen, or whilst it was in process, um, uh, Jane Owen asked um, Richard Meyer to make a small building to his design that would sit next to the roofless church. And as she put it, it was as if there were two giants of uh, classicism and the modernism. Uh, and she wanted this little figure between the two. The giants of modernism would be the roofless church. And then this uh, new, new, new kind of building, uh, the white building would be down here. And she wanted this kind of mediator. And that's what she got. It was destroyed because the, there was rot in the building. Uh, happened very, very quickly uh, without um, uh, careful discussion. It was a real tragedy. Uh, should never have happened. Um, Meyer's buildings, yeah, they rot, particularly over in the Hamptons. But uh, a concerned uh, 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 owner will just have the uh, offending pieces um, replaced. So uh, a follow-up to that uh, real quick. Uh, Tom Stahl has mentioned that there's a large square hole next to the pottery studio. Do you know what that is for? Basement, it was the original basement of the building because there was a house there that burned and uh, there were some very important pieces of sculpture burned in that building, including uh, the uh, Holy Family uh, that was to go into the um, Grotto for Meditation. Uh, so kind of a great uh, uh, segue into uh, this question. Um, and this is for Jack or Ben. Um, you briefly mentioned the Roofless Church. Can you uh, maybe speak to the importance of the Roofless Church? While not uh, a Richard Meyer building and obviously not the Athenaeum, 
What did that mean for New Harmony? Check. So, I, I, honestly, I'm not as familiar with that one as well. I've visited it a number of times, uh, and so I, I don't know what the uh, design task was that Philip Johnson was given, but I know that it references other other aspects of New Harmony. The, the wall that's around the roofless church references the cemetery that doesn't have any gravestones, and, and um, the roofless church uh, is the sacred space with the grass allowing for the public to be seated and, and capture that space. I know that um, from a visitor standpoint, it's always fascinating to see it uh, on, a, as it is on the edge of the town and, and how it views nature and how it views it from an internal standpoint, as well as allowing views to the external. But um, Dan and Ben being residents of, uh, or having places staying in uh, New Harmony, I bet they could speak at, about it from their perspective as to how it fits and works with the community. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in addition to that, um, its origin, Philip Johnson had just um, finished the um, nuclear reactor in the Nagiv Desert for Israel. And um, it was a, a, a remaking of the great tabernacle uh, described in the Bible, of a tent with an enclosure around it. So um, there is references to the Bible. There is references to the Cold War and that incredible struggle that was going on at this particular time, 1958, 59. Uh, and and um, then, uh, in my opinion, the most important thing was Jane wanted a, a building that was open to the sky. Um, there are such buildings, particularly in England, of ruined abbeys uh, when the Protestants destroyed the Catholic uh, uh, abbeys and churches. Um, so that idea of an enclosure um, and, and the walled garden and all sorts of things, um, there is a lineage of that. But the key is that it is a non-denominational -denomination, building for all religions. Uh, uh, um, um, Jack Lipschitz was Jewish, who made the sculpture of the descent of the dove. Uh, and um, uh, uh, also the gates with the Lamb of God in it. So she, she, she was quite happy to have atheists working for her, uh, uh, people of different religions working on different uh, uh, buildings. That was all good for her. So that's the real r reason why the Rufus Church doesn't have a roof. It's open for everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question, and um, I can speak a little bit to this as well as Dan, of course, um, but uh, Mark asks, as much as Meyer should be praised for his use of ceramic panels, um, he wonders what we will do when they inevitably start to show wear, which, um, as I'm sure Dan can attest to, they are starting to show wear. Um, can these panels be maintained or refurbished correctly, and will we work with, or will the work, excuse me, um, be overseen by a party with appropriate expertise? And that's a fantastic question. And again, that's to my point about being thoughtful uh, and responsible as we move forward with the preservation. I mean, you, you have to be 51% um, uh, focused on, you know, the, the budgets available and uh, the, the funding available and 49% preservation, obviously. There's, there's a balance there. But relative to the panels, I know not that long ago, they were regrouted. I believe Connie Weinzaffel was the director at, at the time. Um, so we've, we've, we've worked to care for them. They do wear very well. We do have probably less than 10 that are kind of dented or banged up. Uh, there aren't really that many that, uh, you know, that are noticeable to the public, if you will, that are in uh, terrible shape. It, it's in I'll be honest, in October, when we uh, presented it to the public for the 40th anniversary gala, it was in pretty darn good shape. Um, the fresh paint and such, uh, our USI team has done a, a nice job of really, really keeping it up, and we're going to continue that. Relative to, um, you know, a, a group of folks helping with that, that's, that's our Historic New Harmony Advisory Board, and believe me, that's a topic on the table as, as we move forward. Um, we do have uh, deferred maintenance that we need to catch up on. 
But I will say relative to uh, the safety issues, at some point we have to address those. The spaces between the bars, and I've actually traded emails with Mr. Meyer about this. Uh, he's, um, he's asked us to take inspiration from the High Museum in Atlanta, where they have the mesh uh, 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 on the, the bars themselves you know, for protection. I think that's a change that was made between uh, the Athenaeum and the High. Um, the roof, uh, we, we do need to, um, at some point, do something with that, uh, even from just, a, a, just a, a cost of heating and cooling, uh, whether it's a garden, whether it is, I know, controversial, whether or not we can put solar panels up there, which actually Mr. Meyer thought was a great idea, uh, but the array wouldn't be large enough to support um, the costs or the, the need for the building. But there are you know, there are opportunities to continue with this vision and, and stay true to what it's supposed to be um, and, and the philosophy. So um, no, we, we can't do it. We can't do it alone. So absolutely, we'll have to have people at the table to help guide us and, and keep us true. Great question, Mark. Dan, just to follow up, which I know this is something Thank you- Can I make a response to that? Absolutely. Um, um, these panels are skin deep. Mm -hmm. uh, and for modernist architecture, uh, the Inland Steel Building in Chicago is a very good example. Uh, what, the, what is feared is what the connections are between the steel uh, on the inside of the building and, and the way the water is uh, evacuated and these porcelain panels. So uh, it looks great from the inside, but I'm, I, as I'm sure Jack would, would uh, um, uh, concur, um, this period of modernist building, uh, where a lot of experimenting was going on, um, techniques were, were being developed and no one really knew how successful they were. Uh, it's what's underneath that counts. Great point. Uh, uh, just a quick last, last question for you, Dan. Um, and I know you can talk about this because this is what you're here for. Uh, Randy asks that, or says that enough money can take care of most of our needs. Um, what are the plans to raise the money and what is the total estimate to take care of the Athenaeum? Well, um, so we do have a laundry list and uh, we do not have estimates on some of the um, preservation work moving forward like the grids and such. Um, what we're working on right now is the deferred maintenance and catching up on, on some of that. Uh, again, you know, the, I, the university I think has done a great job with, uh, with the resources that it has, um, keep, you know, keeping it up, uh, but taking it to the next level of preservation so that we can have a 50th or so, um, we, we have to have those estimates. And that's, that's where we work with the university and we work with the board uh, to pull that together. But you think about the uh, right now, uh, what's on my immediate list is um, the roof itself. Uh, we do have one or two leaks that you can see the damage to the, the floors on the second and third floor. Um, the roof is, is top priority. Um, and uh, beyond that, there are a few more fixes to the, uh, the wiring for the lights in the theater. And uh, we still need to soundproof and replace some of the HVAC equipment that is actually the original. Uh, it's held up, but obviously it's not um, economically feasible to continue with it. So we have some critical things that uh, we're, we're working to, to align right now, but uh, more to come on that. And I will promise to report on that work, you know, in our e-newsletter and such. So I would just like to take this moment uh, first to thank all of those that have donated to us in the past. Uh, what was the final amount we raised for the Athenaeum 40th, Dan? Um, it's well over three hundred thousand uh, dollars. I believe we landed at three twenty-five or so. Um, so uh, we're really grateful to all of the uh, all of you, um, and I know some of you are on this call that really uh, were a part of raising those funds and have made us able to do what we have done in the last six months or so. Absolutely. Well, with that, I, I know I know we're twenty minutes over, and I appreciate everyone hanging in there. Um, a, again, a huge thank you to uh, Jack Faber and to Ben Nicholson. Fantastic insight. Uh, I'll say it one more time. Uh, it, it takes great minds and ideas like this to, to, to help us care for this icon moving forward. I thank all of you for, for taking time out of your Thursday to join us. Uh, remember, uh, our next uh, uh, community conversation is with uh, 
poet laureate uh, Matthew Graham. I think that's going to be a, a great one. Um, if you ever have any questions or would like to plan a trip to New Harmony, or, and you're always welcome to email us or call the office and we're glad to help. But uh, with that said, thank you all very much. And we will have this posted on YouTube in the next couple of days. Thank you very much.